Remember Excite? By March 1997, after three years, they'd gone from hacking code in a garage to become an internet media company. Revenues from advertising were into the millions, and they'd outgrown office number three. Time for another move. Three years ago, we visited with six kids in a garage working on their dream. Starting with $18,000 and a bag of brown rice, they built Excite into a company with 200 workers worth a quarter of a billion dollars. And this is just the start. It has to be, because in the world of internet business, the rule is grow or die. So we moved from the garage to the dining room. Uh -huh. We moved from the dining room to an office about 5,000 square feet. We moved from that office to this office about 12,000 square feet. And now we're moving to our final resting place. I wouldn't have even guessed that we would have moved into the Garcia office that, that, we, that we were at, the you know, 2,000 square foot office with little dingy cubes. So that was a step up for us. And then to move in here and then to move into our very own building, it's just a surprise. Excite is visible proof of the Internet's astonishing progress. Its growth mirrors the expansion of the wired world. In four years, the number of Americans using the Internet has risen from 5 million to 62 million. Traffic on the Internet is doubling every 100 days. And the fun's only just begun. We're only two years into this huge revolution called the commercial use of the Internet. We're only two years in. Think where other industries were just two years into their lives. Think where cars were two years into automobiles. Oh, they were terrible. I mean, bicycle wheels, a tiller for the steering wheel, a motor that took you at five miles an hour and died in about a half a mile. If you look back in history, past the scope of this program, past 1970, past 1900, back to when we were human beings in small tribes hunting and gathering, Everybody you had to deal with was somebody you saw every day. And we're a species that's based on communication with our entire tribe. And one thing that modern communication does is make it possible, again, for us to communicate with anybody in the world. Unlike the PC, it levers the top line. It helps us entertain and inform and educate and inspire and sell and make community, uh, even make meaning out of life and out of death. And, and, and that's a far more powerful dynamic than you know, cranking out memos and doing financial analyses with a spreadsheet. Think of this as uh, just a few milliseconds after the Big Bang. I mean, we only barely discern the fundamental laws of physics, the business models that are going to work. What better place for a Big Bang than CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Research? Believe it or not, this is where the explosive growth of the Internet began. Here in Geneva, Switzerland, the next great Internet breakthrough, the World Wide Web, was created by an English programmer named Tim Berners-Lee. It was always different sorts of people from different countries who brought different sorts of computing equipment. And so CERN was at the forefront of making gateways for file transfer exchange so that you could get files from different sorts of computer, email exchange so that you could get email from the proprietary systems to cross borders and go into uh, another proprietary system. And although I wasn't involved with that, that was the spirit. There was a lot of networking. Despite all this networking, there was no simple way for CERN scientists to retrieve information from each other's computers. In fact, it was exactly like the Internet on a small scale. <laughs> I'll be at this forever. What I'm trying to draw here is 160,000 computers in 800 different networks, all running different operating systems, different programming languages. It's a mess. And that was the situation faced by Tim Berners-Lee. He wanted to find a way to get information from this computer over here to this user over here. And the question was, how to get it? 
in fact, it was basically technically trivial to go and get it. It just happened that you had to be a guru of the highest degree to actually be able to navigate all the networks and figure out all the programs that you would come across on your way and, uh, and know, the, uh, you know uh, what commands to give them to actually get the data back. And the chances are when you got it back, you wouldn't be able to actually uh, read it anyway because of all the incompatibilities. I started in October writing a, a program called, which I called World Wide Web. When you're reading something, you could, if it's interesting and you've got right access to it, you could just highlight a phrase, hit a hotkey, control shift N, and it would bring up a, another window. Tim Berners-Lee's greatest achievement may have been giving an address to every bit of information on the internet. You've seen these things. www.cringely.com that's my web page, and this is the address called a Universal Resource Locator. Forget about that. The important thing is that you don't have to know about names of files. You don't have to know where this is. You just have to remember cringely.com, and you're there. By inventing HTTP, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol, Tim figured out how to embed an address under any word or picture you like. And then when you click on that word or icon, you automatically jump through the internet to, say, the Cringely domain. Ah, there's a website for sore eyes. The power of a hypertext link is that it can link to absolutely anything. That's the fundamental concept. The fundamental idea was anything which was out there somewhere sitting on a computer disk where that computer was attached to a network, you ought to be able to give it an address, you ought to be able to make a link to it. The uh, key insight that I think I credit Tim Berners-Lee with is the URL, the idea that there's a uniform resource locator that says I can point at any particular bit of information on the internet. If I mean that you should go to this, this university, look in their FTP archive, look in their file archives, and download this picture of a Corvette and put it up on the screen, I now have a way of doing that. So that's why the characters HTTP backslash www have become as familiar as Coca-Cola. In fact, Tim's idea wasn't new. Twenty years earlier, computer visionary Ted Nelson, author of the seminal hacker work Computer Lib, had proposed a global network. He called it Xanadu, a magic place of literary memory, after Coleridge's poem Kubla Khan. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sacred sea. Xanadu was measureless too. It involved storing all the world's literature on databases and accessing it through links which Ted called hypertext with an automatic system for paying royalties to authors whose work was used. But like Coleridge's vision, Nelson Xanadu never saw the light of day. But Tim's invention did, and the World Wide Web turned a network for geeks into something everyone could use, though not everyone's pleased. Tim Berners-Lee uh, figured out that the key was extreme simplicity. And that's um, very painful to me because, of course, now the Websters are trying to grapple with all the issues we were trying to solve in a single design at the beginning. And the World Wide Web uh, is pretty awful. I mean, I, I, I dearly love Tim Berners-Lee, and I think he's a great guy and a wonderful idealist, and has, he just achieves wonderful things. But the, uh, the unfortunate thing about the World Wide Web is just how, how messed up it is. Perhaps it's sour grapes, but at least Ted Nelson can claim the creation of hypertext. But does he? Hypertext is obvious. <laughs> so I do not claim to have invented hypertext, I merely discovered it. And it's, it's like the telephone. Now the telephone at the time seemed to be an, invent, an invention. To, to us now it was a discovery. Because it's obvious. Okay, so hypertext is like that. To me, it was simply the obvious next step of literature. What is hypertext? Hypertext is non sequential giving. Excuse me too, Ted. I must get back to the World Wide Web. Tim's solution for the world's particle physicists turned out to be a solution for everyone, helping to network incompatible computers. CERN wasn't in the Internet business, but in 1991, they published the code, and within four years, the World Wide Web was sending more packets than any other Internet service. They took the bit, bits and pieces that existed and figured out a way to put them together uh, and make it work. Uh, it was a tour de force. The people who did the World Wide Web were really willing to take uh, existing pieces of things 
in god-awful condition in some cases and figure out a way to make it work in the World Wide Web people deserve a lot of credit for what they did. I mean, what they did was very difficult. The web is success precisely because it is not a monolithic new software product. You don't get web 9.0 in the mail on CD-ROM. The web is a collection of a whole bunch of small technologies that fit together because a, you know, a couple dozen people all thought about how they'd work together cool. And they're all being evolved constantly in real time by thousands of people around the world. And there isn't any central release. You can't go anywhere to go buy a copy of the web. The fact that the World Wide Web did work, I find it's not just exciting for itself, but exciting for the whole idea that you can have an idea, you know, some idea and it can take off and it can happen. Uh, it means that sort of dreamers all over the world should <laughs> take heart and not stop. The web was a huge step toward wiring the world, but more changes were to come. One of these happened far from CERN and far from Silicon Valley, too. It happened here. U.S. government money made possible the ARPANET and the Internet. But there was a catch. There was no commerce allowed on the net. When this restriction was finally lifted, it wasn't Bill Gates or any of the other digital titans who turned the Internet into a commercial marketplace. No, it was the folks on the hill, the custodians of capitalism. It was Uncle Sam. Roll the drums and sound the trumpets for the congressman from Virginia's fighting ninth district, the Honorable Rick Boucher, who in 1992 amended a law. Here are the historic words which made all the difference. This future ubiquitous network for voice, video, and data communications of all kinds will connect homes, schools, and workplaces. It will constitute an essential ingredient for our future economic competitiveness and will open new worlds of information and services for all of the nation's citizens. This is Congress speak for you may now buy and sell things on the net. What made it easy to do so was one more software breakthrough. Time for another word from the cringely glossary of geek. This word is browser. It doesn't sound like much, kind of a laid back word, but there's nothing relaxed about the browser because it changed the face of the internet. Here's how the internet looked in the 1980s. Lists of text. This is Stanford University, but you'd hardly know it from looking. It's not very user friendly. It's actually hard to find what you want, and frankly, it was mainly a tool for nerds. And then came this, an attractive, easy-to-use shop window, a gateway to the riches of the Internet. This is a browser. And just as the Mac made a PC into a computer my mother could love, the browser opened up the Internet to everyone. It was not at Stanford, but on a Midwestern campus that the second great innovation of 90s Internet technology took place. Here, a bright kid named Mark Andreessen was earning minimum wage at nights, writing code in a supercomputer center at the University of Illinois. His prototype browser was a piece of software called Mosaic. We ended up sort of in the middle of the night starting this project that we called Mosaic. What we were trying to do was just put sort of a human face on the Internet. The Internet at that point was a tool for researchers and scientists. For years, Bill Joy had been telling me that someday we'd back a 21-year-old kid who would write software that would change the world. And lo and behold, sitting in my office is this 23-year-old, not a kid. I mean, he's a very mature, hulking, <laughs> uh, young executive. And uh, Mark said this software is going to change everything. For me, this whole thing started exploding with the invention of the browser, you know, Mosaic, because suddenly the Internet was accessible to the average person through this rich graphical interface. You didn't have to know these arcane protocols. You didn't have to be a nerd anymore to access the Internet. Mosaic put a face to the web, and Mosaic plus the web then finally gave us a way to express to the non-technical person what all of us in computing knew was the tremendous value of having networks interconnected. And now everyone's a webhead and everyone's excited about the web. Those ideas will have been present for 20 years, but it took a killer application, clearly Mosaic. Mark's Mosaic browser spread across the internet like wildfire. It brought him to the attention of an ex-Stanford professor who had already made millions from one startup and felt like doing another, Jim Clark. I said, look, if you can, if you can, um recruit all the guys, every single guy who helped you write that program, then I'll put my own money in it and we'll just start a company and figure out some way to make a business out of it. Exactly. And that's, that's exactly what we did. I put $3 million in. We flew out to University of Illinois four days later, signed them all up. 
After a brief tussle with Illinois over the Mosaic name, Jim and Mark's new company became Netscape. Their product was a Mosaic killer, Navigator. Jim's plan for the company was, well, minimalist. Well, my attitude was, if 20, 25 million people are on the net today, one million of them are using Mosaic. This was, bear in mind, April 94. Um, and we can displace Mosaic. There's 24 more million people who would like a product like this, presumably. And the, market, the, the size of the net was doubling roughly every year and a half. So I meant by the time we had our products in the marketplace, it would be 50 million people. So you've got to be able to make money with 50 million people using your product. And that was, that was the sum total of the business plan at that time. It, it didn't take a rocket science to figure out that there was a big market here. And uh, we had uh, one meeting with Jim and Mark after that, decided to invest, and then set about on a crash program of 120 days to hire four vice presidents and a world-class CEO and get the Netscape product shipped. Well, fortunately, One time. fortunately, you had the money. Uh, fortunately, I had the opportunity. The money was easy. It was the, knowing the opportunity and recruiting the people. Well, in about a year and a half's time, we had 65 million users. The most rapidly uh, assimilated product in history. In other words, no one had ever achieved an install base of 65 million anything. In fact, I don't know if anyone had ever achie achieved that kind of install base in anything, except perhaps Microsoft. So and Beanie Babies. And Beanie Babies, okay. In 1994 and 95, Netscape was known as the fastest growing company in the industry with all the requisite Valley attributes. Shiny, low-rise buildings, Generation X workforce, and a parking lot reserved just for roller hockey. Today, they're famous for the fact that they're going head-to-head -head with Microsoft. The folks at Illinois did some clever work early on. Now that happened to include Andreessen and you know Netscape got formed, but there was some clever work done at Illinois. There's always going to be some clever work done someplace that's not here. Hopefully there's a lot of clever work done here too, but there's always going to be some clever work done someplace else. And number two, we had a big thing we had to get done called Windows 95. And while we managed to get a browser done and built in because we weren't asleep, it didn't get the same kind of passionate forward, 100% focus that we love to give things because we had a lot of that focus already into doing the basic job of Windows 95. And so a little bit of cleverness and a little bit of sort of other priority was all it took to create a window. That's how dynamic and competitive this industry is in which Netscape emerged. We also were making money on it. <laughs> You know, that was it. We, our first full year of business was $75 million in revenue, and the next year was $375 million. We were, until Microsoft kind of came in and punched us in the face, we were the fastest growing company in history. It's another example of With his Navigator browser um, dominating the internet, these were sunny days for Mark and Netscape. The storm would come later. Thanks to the World Wide Web and the browser, the internet was transformed. Suddenly, here was the recipe for commercial opportunities in cyberspace. A giant feast of digital delights laid out for anyone with a PC and a modem to enjoy. So how does it work? The internet is like a giant restaurant. You look in a menu for something that appeals, order it, the order goes off somewhere and is served up by a waiter or waitress. Well, the internet's the same way. The individual PC that's ordering the information is called a client. And the big computer at the end of the line that provides what the client needs is called the server. These days it often takes so long, perhaps it should be called a waiter. The business of building these servers is another of the opportunities created by the internet. And serving up information turns out to be very profitable. It's selling like hotcakes. The biggest of these information providers is America Online, a company now worth $16 billion. Even in the real world of trains, planes, and automobiles, many of us still need a tour operator to package our travel. Founder Steve Case saw a similar opportunity in the virtual world, offering beginners the internet experience in an all-in-one package. Now this may be a virtual world, but it still needs real hardware. In all this talk of wiring the world, it's easy to forget that someone actually has to do the job of wiring it. And that's happening here at America Online's new data center in Virginia, where computers and routers and modems are going in that are going to give 10 million people access to the internet and beyond. 
Excuse me. Welcome. You've got mail. In 1982, bought my first computer and wanted to hook it up and be part of this this, this online world and, and went to great lengths to make that happen. It took many months, hundreds of dollars to get the modem to work with the software, to work with the cable, to work with the computer, to actually connect to this this this, this uh, world. So it was very frustrating. At the same time, I found it kind of exhilarating that I actually got it to work and I was able to access information and talk to people all around the world from my little desktop in Wichita, Kansas, which is where I was living at the time. So I thought the whole thing was really quite magical. And the companies that are leaders in making that happen and popularizing that concept for a mainstream audience, I think are going to be very, very successful. And we'd like AOL to be in this new interactive world what AT&T was in the telephone business 100 years ago, or Microsoft has been more recently in the, in the software business. There's a, there's a big opportunity here. Oddly enough, Microsoft wanted to be the Microsoft of the online market, too. But for a change, Microsoft didn't succeed. The Microsoft Network was our uh, decision to get into the online service business. Uh, we thought that for people at home in particular, this would be explosive. And we, we very much uh, believe that to this day. Uh, Electronic mail, staying in touch with your friends, seeing what's going on in the local community, getting up-to-date news, uh, and having that be nicely packaged with chat sessions and neat new software features. We saw a market for that. Even I made a foray into this marketplace. Back in 1994, Apple Computer created an online consumer service called eWorld. One of its notable attractions was the columnist Robert X. Cringely. At the time, I made this bold statement. So my job on eWorld is to create controversy and therefore get a lot of people talking over the electronic back fence. Impressive. eWorld went belly up, though Apple fights on. And me? Why do you think I'm schmoozing with the guy who runs America Online? He has 10 million subscribers already. But 80% of Americans well, aren't wired. Films, so That's what I'd call an opportunity. There are more users, more websites, and more data sources joining the Internet every day. Plenty brings its problems. The more places you have to look for information, the harder it is to find what you want. We need help. So people have invented tools for the job. Search engine, another word invented for the Internet. The World Wide Web is an enormous collection of database libraries that hold information rather than books. The problem is, how do you find what you want to know in that mass of information? Well, librarians cracked that problem years ago. They invented the catalog. Rather than look individually through all those books, I can find what I want by searching this card catalog. On the Internet, the same thing is accomplished by a search engine. It continually catalogs and indexes every word in all those databases. So if you want to know about, say, the career of Arnold Schwarzenegger, go to the search engine, it searches its index, and presto, there's everything you ever wanted to know about Arnie. And a lot you didn't. Two things are constant in Silicon Valley, the steady consumption of soda and change. Excite's original product was just a search engine. Now they've built a business around it. They changed the company name. The offices changed from grungy to glitzy. And in 1995, they became that web phenomenon, an internet media site. A cross between an electronic newspaper and a cable network, funded by advertising. We call ourselves publishing on steroids. So devoid of print, paper, and ink, we do what a publisher does, or a cable provider does. We aggregate consumers around our programming, and then we sell that demographic back to advertisers. The different ways to make money in the internet are just beginning to emerge. For Excite, the model is a media channel with content to attract me and advertising to catch my eye while I'm there. But there are other ways. 
pay-per-view, mail order shopping of every kind, games, auctions, and services with no earthly parallel. They're all putting their faith in a new medium to deliver the big payoff. Every time a new visual medium is invented, one application drives the market. This was true for still photography, true for motion pictures, it was especially true for VCRs, and it's true for the World Wide Web. I'm talking about sex. Sex sells, but there is a market for it, and it's true capitalism. If there's a market for it, it will be filled, and it's legal, and there's nothing wrong with it. In the beginning of this industry, like other industries, people are willing to pay for adult content. The home video cassette industry is, is a prime example. Initially, people were paying several thousand dollars back in the 70s for machines uh, to go home and basically watch adult content. As part of this job, of course, you have to type. Is there, is there a typing speed requirement? No. You know, you want to have your nails manicured and everything, and nails do slip a lot on the keyboard. Sure. But as long as you just like simple things like, hi, how are you, babe? You know, and you could just put R, U. You don't mm -hmm. have to put the whole word down. Sure. And then most of the time you're saying, oh, yeah, baby. So you go, <laughs> oh, <laughs> then you go, oh, baby. Does your mom know the, the, the work you do? Yeah, actually she does. Yeah, she's okay with it. You know, it's the 60s thing. She's all in that 60s life. Oh, you so. had a hippie mom. Yeah. So it's it's great now. Cool. Grandma, on the other hand, would not understand. But then anything with computers? Mm -hmm. Oh, honey, you're moving up in the world. And <laughs> computers, that computer thing, that's going far, that's going far. That's futures <laughs> in computers. So as long as they tell them about computers, it's fine. It didn't take long for the advertising industry to notice the growing number of eyeballs staring at websites, or for website operators to start selling those eyeballs to the advertisers. In 1999, online advertising revenue will reach $2 billion, and it's been doubling each year. How about advertising? Well, people say, what a puny number. The software industry only had $300 million in advertising for that internet supported internet companies that were supported by advertising. Well, I say, like, yo, a year before that we had zero. Now we had 300. This March we had 57 million. Who thought we would own advertising? Advertising is the most uh, frequent form of money making for us and we have enough people coming to our various online sites that advertisers are interested. And so that's been, uh, for the last two years, uh, the majority of our revenue. But then uh, merchandise as well. We have books, we have primers, email services. We do free massages as well. Meet two wise fools, Tom and Dave Gardner. They are dedicated to debunking the gurus of Wall Street and sharing financial advice with other net users. The Motley Fools, an archetypal web service, irreverent, inclusive, and informed, and growing like crazy. In the internet, things change every three months. You just can't possibly prepare. If, we're, if a typical company grows about 10% a year, we're growing about 15% a month. That means each month feels like a year. And if you saw Dave, he's about a foot and a half taller about a year ago. I was a, I was a fetching fellow back then. The Motley Fool today is a media company which is, whose mission is to teach people how to invest their own money. We have 600,000 households coming to the Motley Fool every month. Building communities where people can aggregate ideas. Let's say we, ha we put 100,000 people together in a block that are going to buy insurance or they're going to buy mutual funds. If we can package them together have everyone work together, we're going to be able to cut prices significantly. And that's the beauty of, of, of going online, of being online. You have a voice. Everyone has their little uh, publishing house right there in their home. Everybody has Very ideas good. to share. What makes a good fool? A fool is someone who thinks for herself, somebody who uh, is willing to roll up his sleeves and make his own decisions. One size fits all, actually. Yeah. It's a, oh, <laughs> there, my reputation precedes me. <laughs> Nothing foolish about saving money on groceries. A website called Planet U sends your grocery coupons direct to the checkout, replacing bulk mail and saving trees all at once. The idea came from hyper-nerd Christine Comerford. The key concept is eating. If you don't eat, you're dead. 
okay? So how about taking the most basic thing that we all have to do, right, and bringing those packaged goods, the people who promote this salsa, whatever, wheat thins, okay, bringing those people to advertise on the net, because you've got to buy paper towels anyway. So the thing is, 325 billion coupons are distributed in the USA annually. 2% are redeemed. Only 2%? 2%, 2%, yes! 98%, all right, end up in the rubbish or in the recycling. It is okay. totally ineffective. So once you grab your Planet U promotions, either from a partner website or from the Planet U website, you can then say, I want my promotions mailed to me or I want my promotions delivered to the store that I shop at. Aha! Uh -huh. So you can deliver them to the point of sale system. You walk in, you identify yourself by swiping whatever card you set up as your ID. All right? And then, ka-ching, the register receipt has a deduction. Ka-ching is right. In 1995, there were 27,000 commercial websites. In 1998, three quarters of a million. Thirty times as many. Mail order is becoming email order. And you don't have to dress up to go shopping. In fact, you don't have to dress at all. In terms of infrastructure costs, buying underwear in your underwear is hard to beat. And if you buy the same underwear, you know exactly what the product is. You don't have to look at it. You, you buy Munsing wear 34s or whatever, you know, kangaroo pouch, you know, you know, 12 pair. Please mail it to my house. There's this very American temptation to use the internet to sell things. But what to sell? Well, everyone on the net can already read and write. So the first big commercial success is using digital technology to push that most analog of products, the printed word. But this is not Gutenberg being replaced by the World Wide Web. It's Gutenberg enhanced, using modern technology to sell books. Lots and lots of books. In the spring of 1994, I came across the statistic that web usage was growing at 2,300% a year. And outside of a Petri dish, I hadn't seen anything grow that fast. I made a list of 20 different products that you might be able to sell online and picked books as the first best product, primarily because there are so many books. There's no way to have a two and a half million title physical bookstore. The largest physical bookstores in the world only have about 175,000 titles. And there's no way to have a print catalog. If you were to print the Amazon.com catalog, it would be the size of more than 40 New York City phone books. The basic technology is fairly simple. The problem was ubiquity of that technology. And this looked like, because of that growth rate, the first time ever that the basic technology needed to do electronic commerce in an acceptable way would be ubiquitous. So it actually turns out that the ubiquity of the internet is more important than the technology of the internet. The internet is creating the biggest Californian job boom since the gold rush. And America is running out of homegrown engineers. But the language of the internet is English. So wherever you come from, if you're a decent programmer and speak English, apply here. The sound of leather on willow. It's a cricket game, but we're not in England. We're in Santa Clara County, the most heavily wired and networked community in the world. The Valley employs thousands of Indian-born engineers who bring with them not only their programming skills and their engineering degrees, but also their cricket balls and bats. Sunshine and a field to play is all we ask for. And since there's this big boom um, in America, in, in Silicon Valley here, um, which require a whole bunch of engineers to come all the way from India, you know, we make the big you know, a uh, trip up to America to work, and then we come here and find out that there's cricket being played. India is the second largest uh, country with the number of engineers after the United States uh, in the whole world. So I think that is a factor. And the second thing is because uh, it's an English-based system, it's a lot easier for people to come from India and integrate and uh, do business in the United States. With the arrival of the internet, companies here can now fill their job vacancies with skilled Indian engineers who don't have to leave India. Could be bad news for the local cricket scene. I work in an industry where there's zero unemployment. You can't get skilled labor at any price. So we're scouring the world, world market to get programmers. The quality of the people is astonishing. The loyalty of the people and the work ethic, the quality of their English, I mean, everything just blew us away. 
we just had a fabulous, had a fabulous experience uh, uh, in, in Bangalore, and we're expanding our operations there very, very rapidly. <laughs> For all the outward differences, India's Silicon Valley has a lot in common with my Silicon Valley, starting with traffic jams and construction everywhere. The street signs and billboards are all in English. Bangalore is busy and booming because of the huge numbers of programmers Western companies are putting to work. The Internet has become a worldwide digital communication network that rivals in size the telephone system. So here we are, 12,000 miles, 12 time zones away from where I live in Silicon Valley in California, in Bangalore, the Silicon Valley of India. Programmers here solve the problems of users around the world. Companies founded here serve customers in Europe and the United States. And it all happens because of the Internet. So, so what we have done is to set up a uh, um, company here, the kind of investment which you, which you see here, which you have made, oh, yeah. with a clear approach to do work in India, leverage those skills, develop those technology skills in India, so that we leverage that for Novell. Novell, the netware company from Utah, is constructing a new Indian headquarters building here. 21st century technology built by pre-industrial labor. We work with uh, GE, General Electric, almost all the units of GE, uh -huh. uh, Allied Signals, uh, Sequent, uh -huh. Xerox, Putnam Investor Services in Boston, uh -huh. uh, Tandem, Cisco, Stratacom. Sundar Sankaran is a typical young programmer in Bangalore. Sundar offered to take me to work with him on the back of his motor scooter. Apparently, every one of his fellow programmers had exactly the same idea. They say that in Bangalore, every second person writes code, and everybody honks at the traffic lights. Honking is a major pastime out here. So you tend to get bored, you generally honk for some time. <laughs> Makes you feel nice. <laughs> In India, we have a computer as part of the curriculum. Now it starts in class 3, grade 3 as you would call it. Uh -huh. So I've been doing some kind of programming or other since uh, class 8. When I was there, it was class 8. Uh -huh. So once I finished my bachelor's, I got into a non-formal institute for computer learning. And then started uh, programming. Programmers in Bangalore are awake when America is asleep. The internet has perfected the 24-hour workday. <laughs> You're working when your customer is sleeping. Uh -huh. Okay, to that extent, if he gives you a problem during his working hours, you solve it and send it back to him by the time he starts working. So, I mean, it's, it's a great advantage, especially if you're doing things offshore. We get a call in the evening through email saying there's a problem. Next day morning when people come to the US, problem is solved. Uh -huh. While the customer gets surprised saying, well, I just told you at 5 o'clock in the evening, how come in the morning you guys solved it? Now the problem is solved in other part of the world by really using this 24 hour development cycle. It's not only cricket the British Empire gave India, it also made English the language of government and higher education, which gives Indian engineers another great advantage. People here know English, unlike Japan or China and places like that. People know English, you know, so that is a lingua franca of, you know, software. You have to know English. My kids uh, study in an English medium school. They cannot uh, read or write my own, own mother tongue, which I'm able to do it, but the next generation is not able to do that. Same way you'll find that Indians don't have pr problems speaking of languages. They can speak French, they can speak, you know, Belgian probably, you know. Most of the languages, people going from here, they pick up very easily. For an American, especially an American from Silicon Valley, it's almost impossible to imagine India as a high technology development center. I mean, just look around. This, this is amazing. 
The average person in an Indian school learns at least three languages, English, Hindi, and their local language. Some of them know five or six. Compare that to American students. Think about it in terms of computer languages. What are they? They have uh, syntax, they have characters, they have objects, they have verbs. What's the difference between C++ and Hindi? Not all that much, really. They have a 5,000-year tradition of mathematics, which we don't. After the World Wide Web and the browser, there's a third breakout invention that's driving the expansion of the web lifestyle. It's called Java, a network programming language named after the Valley's favorite fuel. Like the others, it's helped make the Internet easier to use for anyone, anywhere, and with any kind of computer. Because the Internet grew in such a haphazard way, the computers on it use many different programming languages. This wasn't a problem when the networks were separate, but when the World Wide Web made it possible for them to communicate, there had to be a way to make it easy. A guy named James Gosling came up with the answer. He invented a language that would run the same on any computer, one size fit it all, which was good for business. And like everything else on the Internet, it had a strange name, Java. Maybe he drank too much coffee while working on his invention. Better than naming it Budweiser. One of the most brilliant programmers on the planet, Bill Joy calls him the greatest programmer in the world, came into my office one day because I'd heard he was upset. And I said, James Gosling, what, what's the matter? Why aren't you happy? This was like in the early 90s. And he says, I'm tired of dealing with all this old legacy computer environment. It's just, for a great programmer, it's, it's kind of like trying to fly by flapping your wings. And he said, I want to go out and create a new environment. It was conceived way back in 1990, 91 time frame um, by a few engineers at Sun Microsystems who wanted to create a better, uh, better world um, in terms of software delivery, software um, deployment. And they were imagining consumers being plugged into this networked world. What they didn't realize at the time was it was the internet, it was going to be the internet. What's Java? I mean, Java is a building material. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like concrete. Um, it's something that you can use to build software out of. But it's a material that's got some, some pretty different properties. The one that has sort of gotten the most airtime that most people hear about is write once, run anywhere, or being architecture neutral, uh, where you can sort of write a program once and it will actually run on different machines. Um, and it can rove across the network. And I said, hey, I don't care what you want to do. Whoever you want to do it, whenever, how long, ever long, with whoever, for as much money, I'll set you up in a room, I'll give you all the raw meat and jolt cola and potato chips you want, anything you need, for as long as you want, just go do something great. He said, really? I said, yeah, now get out of here. So he went off, we set him up in downtown Palo Alto, and they started hiring a bunch of really great people, and they... You know, it was kind of like Groundhog Day. They'd come out every now and then, they'd look around, and I'd look and see what they had, and I'd go, I don't get it. And they'd go, okay, so they'd go back in. Certainly early on, I don't think Scott had a good idea what it was about or what it was for. Uh, you know, it was sort of this, this group of, you know, rabble-rousers off in the corner doing something really odd that he didn't know how it related to their main business. Um, and, you know, the truth is that, at, you know, in the early times, it didn't relate to the main business. Everyone knows that if you go to the computer store, you have to buy software that runs on Windows or a different piece of software that runs on the Mac. With Java, you can take a single program and it will run on both and it will run on both well. That opportunity was created because of the, the Internet. Because the Internet is a mixed network and it doesn't make sense to have 20 versions of your software on a single server. So the promise of the Internet coincided just at the right time with the great inventions by people like James Gosling in the language. It's taken the world by storm. It, uh, it's very clearly now going to be in some 300 million computers just three years from now. I think there's 200 books on the market right now on Java, 4 million programmers programming in it, and it's uh, only 700 days old. So that's phenomenal. I've done many things that have gotten very popular but amongst a very sort of nerdy community. Um, because the, the kind of stuff I do is stuff that I have no idea how to explain it to my mom. And, and, or even explain, you know, even at a high level why it's interesting to my mom. And so it tends to stay in a fairly closed community. And 
and to have something that has touched people's everyday lives um, surprised that surprised me. The 1990s internet has spun off two significant challenges for Bill Gates. Both Netscape's browser and Sun's programming language Java were not invented at Microsoft. Bill was slow to see the challenge at first, then he took action. Here on the shore of Lake Washington near Seattle stands a monument to Bill Gates' brilliance, or at least to his money. The last time anyone tried to estimate, Bill's new house was going to cost $50 million. But over the last two years, his wealth has increased at a rate of $31 million per day. So no matter what it costs, it doesn't matter. Bill Gates didn't get to be the richest man in the world just because he's smart or just because he's lucky. It's because he's smart and lucky and knows it and pushes his every advantage to the limit. Bill had largely ignored the internet. How could a non-commercial network offer a business opportunity? But by 1994, there was growing buzz about the web and Netscape, especially among new Microsoft recruits fresh from college. At the urging of the troops, Bill went surfing. It was an all-nighter that changed Microsoft and the internet industry. Bill went down to his place in the uh, Hood Canal and with instructions on how to get on and what to go look for and he got on and started looking around and then started just going from site to site and I think eventually spent the greater part of all night on the, on the net and came back and had a meeting and described that, uh, the experience and said that uh, he was kind of blown away with just how much was really there. Well we always assumed that Microsoft would be our biggest enemy um, because they would have to uh, turn their attention to this. Uh, we got lucky for a while in that they just they weren't paying attention. Um, there were people inside Microsoft who knew what Microsoft should do to respond to us, but the, the management team at Microsoft was sort of almost willfully ignoring what was happening. Gates is a smart guy. Unlike the management of IBM in the middle 80s, Bill Gates is awake and functioning, and he noticed that the Internet was not going to be ignored. He tried to ignore it briefly, and then he saw it wasn't, quickly he saw, in time he saw that it wasn't going to be ignorable. What Bill Gates did was turn an industry super tanker on a dime. At first he didn't really get the internet, but once he did, he wrote a memo called The Coming Internet Tidal Wave and quickly refocused the entire company on responding to the new environment. It's like Henry Ford going into aircraft production or Boeing into pizza delivery, but it worked. Microsoft was ever building just in a new direction. Bill likes to have a general feeling of paranoia throughout the entire company as to you know, who's going to come along with something that's going to destroy one or all of our businesses. And so people are very receptive to um, an understanding of a, of a sudden direction change. When Bill finally says that, boy, we better do something about this, um, instantly people get it. I wrote a memo at one point called the Internet Tidal Wave that very explicitly said, you know, I've told you many times in the past, I think uh, the Internet is a, is a priority. I'm now telling you it is the priority. And the timing was very good there because we were getting along in terms of Windows 95. We thought we had that all well understood and we could really get a lot of energy focused on the Internet. Microsoft announced to the world their change of direction on a date with historic significance for Americans, Pearl Harbor Day. It was actually uh, Admiral Yamamoto who observed uh, that he feared they had but awakened a sleeping giant. We did a, a big event on uh, December 7th, it must have been 1995, where we for the first time showed the world how this had all built up and they saw hey this is pretty dramatic this company uh, is going to deliver great internet software so that saying it was an epiphany is a little too much but uh, saying that 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 it became the centerpiece of our strategy that's absolutely right you will hear from us that you know we're not forming an internet division uh, to us that's you know, it's like having an electricity division or uh, a software division. Uh, the internet is pervasive in everything that, that we're doing. 
the big break happened at the famous Pearl Harbor Day talk, uh, um, but you know Microsoft was doing a bunch of stuff leading up to that. And in, fa in fact, they have this they have this this thing they do now, which is every three months they come out and say, you know, and reannounce how hardcore they are about the internet. And and so they've they've like done that like five or six times now. When the slumbering giant awoke, this was the result. Microsoft's own browser, the Internet Explorer, a product designed specifically to compete with Netscape Navigator. Funny, don't they look alike? But in 1996, there was a big difference between them. Netscape Navigator cost business users $49. Internet Explorer was free. They're working hard, as you can see here, implementing all the standards we need. And what, what do you think we'll charge for that? Like all the others, nothing. OK, well, that's, that's quite a deal. <laughs> Ours was always not free. It was freely downloadable. But if you were a business using it, you had to talk to Netscape about a licensing agreement. That was the way we felt we would be able to make money in the early days. And that was the way we made money. We made $75 million the first year in revenues and $375 million in the second year. The third year ended up, ended up being somewhere north of $500 million in revenues. And, and I, um, we did that by selling Giving, giving licenses for companies to make company-wide use of the browser. Microsoft's free Internet Explorer started taking market share from Netscape. To people who care about the market benefits of competition, that's a controversial thing to do. Giving it away is an anti-competitive technique. They're trying to kill Netscape by drying up its revenue sources. And it's, it should be illegal. They should not be permitted to do that. In, uh, if, if, there's, if any antitrust has any use, it's to go in now and say, you, call, you spend millions and millions of dollars to develop the thing, and you give it away. Hmm. Why are you doing that? Clearly, you're doing that to damage Netscape. You're not allowed to do that. Microsoft came along in an attempt to put us out of business, gave away the browser totally free, even to companies who wanted to use it for business, and it, it definitely had an impact on us. As a consequence, we had to give away, give away our browser. The results were just as the first exponent of giveaway software would have predicted. John McAfee. If you have two competing products and they are on a par in terms of functionality and usability, the free one is the one that will propagate. I mean, have the full Maybe that's why Microsoft is just a little sensitive exactly about whether they are or are not giving their browser away. Well, Microsoft's never been accused of not knowing how to make money. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you can sell volume uh, software, you can do quite well. Now, in order to keep Windows very strong, we felt having a free browser that promoted our extensions, as well as providing all the power of, of all the other standards, that that was critical to our strategy. And so the browser investment is totally paid for by the fact that it helps Windows. And Windows is a very good, uh, quite profitable business. Do we give away software? I don't think so. so. Nobody ever told us we were giving away the print manager, the thing that lets you configure printers in Windows. It's just a built-in piece of Windows. The browser, similar, is really a built-in piece of Windows. Now, we sometimes update it when it's not time to update the rest of Windows. And so we basically sort of think, mm, let's make sure people get all those updates. But in point of fact, to run our browser, you got to own Windows. So in a sense, while the browser itself may be free, we're getting paid. On May 18, 1998, the Microsoft Netscape dispute took on a new dimension. The U.S. government stepped into the fight. The Department of Justice filed an antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft alleging anti-competitive practices in the browser market. The Justice Department has charged Microsoft with engaging in anti-competitive and exclusionary practices designed to maintain its monopoly in personal computer operating systems and attempting to extend that monopoly to Internet browser software. The intervention of Uncle Sam into an industry which until now hasn't had much regulation is a seismic event in the history of the Internet. It may take years to resolve, but you know, I bet Microsoft even has plans to deal with regulatory earthquakes. Well, Netscape is the, is the leader and Microsoft is the big... Microsoft's playing the role of IBM, if I might go back to the mid-80s. So Microsoft is the big bumbling company who got taken by surprise with the Internet, and, My and Netscape is 
the Microsoft <laughs> has switched roles. So Microsoft is now the dominant monopoly, which relies on much too often, I think, on its size rather than its excellence to succeed. Well, Netscape's done a very good job, and you always expect new people to come along. I didn't know, you know, what their name would be or who they would be, but they'll always be every year. Uh, companies that latch on to what the latest thing is and, and get a lot of visibility uh, and deliver products that relate to that. They're ruthless and vicious and if they decide they want the business you're in, ask anybody who's gone up against them directly. And in fact, of course, they weren't in our market when we started. So we were hardly going after a market that they were aware of, but they then realized it could be a big market. And it's their God-given right to own any big market in software. When you're up against Bill Gates and his money, and he is following this strategy, the best bet is to get into another business. You know, just say, okay, forget it, I'll do something else in life. Because you cannot compete with that. So who will win this battle of the browsers? Well, Microsoft's Blitzkrieg has already taken a big bite out of Navigator's market share, forcing Netscape to match Microsoft's tactics and give their browser away. Is history repeating itself? Will Bill Gates own the internet the way he already owns the PC universe? I don't think so. No one owns the internet, and it's a big place, growing so fast, there's always room for someone with a dream, a taste for cola, and a willingness to go without sleep. Someone like Joe Kraus of Excite. The 26-year-old tycoon gives me a tour of the new headquarters for his billion-dollar company. This is where I figured we'd film the death of Spock scene, okay? So you put me in here, you put me in here, and you turn the halon on. The last mind melt. Tell my wife I love her. It's a new show. It's a, it's a show every 90 minutes. I'm like Shamu. <laughs> hey, you brought with you the alien baby. <laughs> you know, this is leaking. Security level 10. Uh, we've got well, like the garage You like the garage door? You started in the nice garage. Time. Now you have a this garage is, This door. conference room is actually called the garage. Uh-huh. Right? So we figure, sort of hark back to our roots here in the garage. This is for executive caliber meetings. He dons the bolt. The first time we were with you guys was, I don't know, 94? Okay, right. Three years ago. 94 in another garage. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I had a sense at that time, just a, just a, a little sense, that you basically had no idea what you were in, you know, up against. That hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> just looking around me and saying, wow, you know, we have all these fantastically dynamic people that we're working with, and, you know, this company exists here because of us, because of something that we started, and um, that's <laughs> insanely gratifying. I was sort of listening to myself talk about this and think, wow, are we really successful at this point? Have we really gotten that big? So that now I'm telling small startup companies how to, you know, how to do the same thing. So I think that the remembering back to the garage helps keep, uh, helps keep you paranoid because you realize how quickly things can go from garage to something like this. And I think we all feel extremely proud and happy and, uh, of, of what's been accomplished. But I think that uh, it sort of reminds you that just as easily as you can make it here, you can make it back to the garage. <laughs> this is the Silicon Valley fairy tale. And there are thousands more little gangs of dreamers eating burritos and working all night to make their fortunes in the wired world. So they could celebrate one day with a trip to Hawaii. We had all said at some point, you know, the six founders were all going to take a trip to Hawaii. And it always was sort of, well, when we accomplish the next thing. And when we accomplish the next thing, we'll do it. So when we get our funding, we'll do it. We got the funding, we didn't do it. When we get our strategic round of financing, we'll do it, and we didn't do that. When we get this deal, we'll do it, and we didn't do it. We're in Hawaii. So the Excite guys got to Hawaii at last. Aloha, Graham. Four years ago, he had a one-sixth share in a bag of rice. Today, he's worth a hundred million dollars. Dreams large and small can come true in the age of the Internet, as any computer billionaire will tell you. I went on a camping trip two weeks ago with my family. How did I find the campground? They 
good old page. I got up there and it showed the nice little bunnies and the cabins and the tent sites. Boom, I reserved right there on the spot. Let's go camping. The internet has come a long way from the halls of the Pentagon, time sharing, and the first faltering attempts at packet switching. To my way of thinking, the ARPANET is the best investment this country has ever made other than probably the Louisiana Purchase. No one owns the internet. No one controls the internet. The internet is the common heritage of all humankind. The killer after the internet is telepresence. It's using the net to be places that you don't have to go to. We want to have a conference where everyone attends but nobody goes. So that's how you get your name on a ballpark. Maybe one day this will be Excite Park, or Cringely Park, or a virtual park which everyone attends on the web. But for Peanuts and Cracker Jack and that authentic sunburn up in the bleachers, I guess you just have to be there. To the call, buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I never come back, cause it's root, root, root for the whole team. If they don't win, it's a shame. Cause it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the whole ball game.